Whatever conclusions we draw from history, the facts start with individuals. So I'd like to start with a single individual. Her name was Irena Lipschitz, and see where her story can lead us. I think it can lead us very far. Irena Lipschitz was a Warsaw Jew. She lived in Warsaw, in independent Poland in the 1920s and 1930s. When Germany invaded Poland on the 1st of September 1939, she fled eastward. She was among the 250,000 or so Polish Jews, Jews of Polish citizenship, who fled the Wehrmacht by going east. Most of these people were received by the local Jewish communities in eastern Poland, the towns, the villages, the Stetlach of eastern Poland, taken in and helped for as long as that was possible. What these refugees from German power could not have known, could not have anticipated, was that on the 17th of September, 17 days after the German invasion, the Red Army then invaded Poland from the east. So all of these refugees, these quarter of a million Polish Jews, found themselves under a new regime, no longer in eastern Poland, but very soon in expanded Soviet republics, Soviet Belarus, Soviet Ukraine. And so Arena Lipschitz lived in a tiny, tiny place called Wysotsk. She herself was very much a city person. One can tell from her story that she didn't know very much about living in small towns or in the countryside. She found herself in a little place called Wysotsk, which is in northern Volhynia, close to what's now the Ukrainian-Belarusian border, in the Polesian marshes, so amidst forests and swamps. She lived there with local Jews, for about two years. In June of 1941, as you'll all know, Germany begins a second major eastern invasion. In Operation Barbarossa, the Wehrmacht pushes eastward a second time, now into the Soviet Union. And so Erena, along with the local Jews of Isotsk, along with millions of other Jews, refugees, local people, find themselves under German power. In September of 1942, the Jews of Vysotsk, along with a few refugees, such as Irena, were gathered up to be executed. Irena chose to, chose to flee. She fled into the forest. She fled into the swamps. She spent a few days living as she could, eating only berries and mushrooms that she could find, but decided that this was not a tenable way to continue life, and in her desperation, made the choice to simply find the first road, but not really a road. If you think of the swamps of Polesia, we're not talking about roads, we're talking about paths. We're talking about dirt paths, trod sometimes by horses, but usually by individual people. Um, she decided that she would simply stand by the first path she found, put out her hand, and ask for help. And that is what she did. She emerged from the forest, she stood on a path and waited. And over the horizon came a single man approaching, him, approaching her, she saw he was carrying a double-barreled shotgun over his shoulder. She asked him for help. What can we see from this story? What does Irena's story, this little bit of it that I've told you, tell us about the Holocaust? We are a long way away from the familiar conceptions. We are a long way away in every sense from Auschwitz. We're very far away from Auschwitz in simple terms of physical distance. We're also very far away from Auschwitz in terms of time, in terms of chronology. Auschwitz, at the moment that I'm describing to you, 1939, the German and Soviet invasions, 1941, the German invasion of the Soviet Union, 1942, the mass murder of the Jews of Isotsk. Auschwitz was not at this time uh, a, a major killing site of Jews. It was a camp, but it was not yet a killing center for Jews. We are also a long way away from familiar national histories. One of the ways that we try to understand the Holocaust, as we try to understand other kinds of history, is by seeking after national compartments, looking for national villains, national victims. Her story alone, the story of this one woman, is enough to remind us just how international any plausible history of the Holocaust has to be. After all, she was a Jew but a Polish-speaking Jew. She fled in 1939 from a German invasion. She ended up in a little village 
um, surrounded by people who spoke dialects of Ukrainian very close to Belarusian. She found herself then under Soviet rule with people coming from the east ruling over her who spoke Russian. Then came a German invasion again and she fled into the swamps, the swamps of Palaysia, the place which in all of Europe was famous for the fact that its inhabitants had no known national identity. And there she was all alone with one of them. We were also very far, very far indeed from Germany um, in distance, but also in identity. Irena was of course not a German Jew. The tremendous majority of Jews affected by the Holocaust were not German Jews. 97% of the Jews killed in the Holocaust, 97% had nothing to do with Germany except for the fundamental fact that German policy brought their lives to an end. Um, in this sense, Arena is very typical. A Polish Jew is a typical victim of the Holocaust. The majority of the victims of the Holocaust were Polish Jews. She fled eastward into lands that became the Soviet Union. The second largest number of Jewish victims of, this, of the Holocaust were Soviet Jews. So she's very typical. But we're very far away from German Jews. We're also very far away from Germany. After all, it's not so simple what Germany has to do with the scene that I'm describing. One of my goals in this talk will be to explain or try to explain how German policy led to the situation I'm describing, where Jews are fleeing into the forest and seeking after, refu after refuge. But it's not as simple as it might seem. We want to think, yes, Germany was a very efficient state. We want to think Germany was an extreme example of nationalism or authoritarianism. We'd like to imagine that by 1938 or 1939, when the Second World War began, Germany was some kind of perfect killing machine. But this is simply not the case. The Holocaust did not happen in Germany between 1933 and 1939. It could not have happened just because most Jews lived beyond Germany. But it could not have happened for another, for another reason as well. Germany was incapable of carrying out massive killing policies against Jews on its own territory. All of the killing policies, those directed against Jews and those directed against others, all of the major German killing policies took place in zones beyond pre-war Germany. All of them took place in zones, very special zones, which German policy deliberately made stateless. All of the killing of Jews, almost all of the killing of German victims in general took place in stateless zones. Now, this may seem like something which runs against our intuitions, which perhaps runs against our prejudices about orderly Germans, which perhaps contradicts our intuitions, perhaps our um, unduly ethnic intuitions about ger what Germans are and how they behave. In fact, if we take our eyes for a moment away from the Holocaust and consider the whole scholarship of ethnic cleansing and genocide just for a moment, we learn something which is extremely interesting, which leads us to Arena's story and which might lead us to greater understanding, and that is this. In the last 25 years, people who are not historians have been working on mass killing, thankfully. Those people include sociologists, political scientists, anthropologists. They have been studying analytical categories which they call ethnic cleansing or genocide. Essentially, this started with um, the, the mass killing in Yugoslavia when the term ethnic cleansing shifted from being a term of art to a term of analysis. And the major finding of social scientists is this. It's extremely interesting. They've done hundreds of studies now, thousands of studies. They've done studies of studies. And their major finding is this. What is most closely associated with ethnic cleansing and genocide is not a strong authoritarian state. What is most closely associated with ethnic cleansing and genocide is state failure, state breakdown, the collapse of institutions is most closely associated, historically speaking, taking all the cases with mass murder. Now, how can that possibly help us to understand the Holocaust? It can if we consider what historians have to say about mass killing. What do historians have to say about mass killing? Well, whenever social scientists have a generalization, like the one that I've just presented, the job of historians is to say, aha, I know an exception, right? That's essentially our job description, that we can say, aha, I know an exception. 
And historians do know exceptions. Historians know some very important cases where states have killed large numbers of their own citizens without state failure, without state collapse, without anarchy. Those cases are People's Republic of China, the Soviet Union, and Cambodia. Now, putting the politics of this aside, what is interesting about these places is that they are party states. They are party states. They are places where the most important relationship between an individual and the political system is not the state itself, but the party. Now, why is that so interesting? Because National Socialist Germany, Nazi Germany, was also a party state. What is actually unique about National Socialist Germany, about Nazi Germany, is that it unites the two main things that we know about mass killing. The first thing we know from the social scientists is state failure. The second thing we know from the historians is party states. National Socialist Germany, Nazi Germany, is unique in that it was a party state which for ideological reasons deliberately induced state collapse among its neighbors. And in that zone where it deliberately induced state collapse, the Holocaust could take place. Now, if I'm right, and it's conditions of deliberate anarchy, it's conditions of manufactured state destruction, which permit the mass killing of civilians, you should rightly ask, you would rightly ask, why the Jews? Why the Jews? And here we have to speak about ideology, because party states are different. A party is different from another party because ideologies are different from other ideologies. What was specific about National Socialist ideology was, of course, its attitude towards the Jews. Think of Irena. Think of her eating berries and mushrooms in the swamp. The thinker in the 20th century who defined precisely that as normal was Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler's notion of what was normal in the world was a racial struggle where people were literally living and dying in order to have land, where we were meant to associate life and death with what we could extract ourselves from the land. Adolf Hitler's idea, his general idea, before things became fatally specific in 1941 and 1942, was that Jews would be pushed into some situation where they had to carry out a natural struggle with everyone else for land, and in that situation, they would lose. As you all know, the main idea of Hitlerian ideology is the racial struggle, that you belong to one race, other people belong to another race, and all and we should only experience, we should only ever experience racial solidarity and racial enmity. Hitler's idea of the world was a fundamentally ecological one. There was only so much space, there was only so much land, there's only so much potential for food, and our destiny as members of races is to behave just as if we were members of species and fight until the death for that land. Now, where does anti-Semitism come into this? Right into the very middle. Hitler's idea of racial struggle is the same as his idea of anti-Semitism. His idea of anti-Semitism is specific and very deep and unfortunately very coherent. What Hitler says is, if you have any idea which contravenes racial struggle, if you have a religious idea of mercy, if you have a constitutional idea of a social contract, if you have a philosophical idea of ethics, whatever it might be, whether it's St. Paul, whether it's Trotsky, who Hitler says were the same person, by the way, um, whether, wh wh whatever the idea is, if it allows you to experience solidarity with other human beings, if it allows you to understand the human species as a whole rather than as racial parts, that idea, says Hitler, is Jewish. All of those ideas, says Hitler, are Jewish. And what this means is that anything which is holding people away from the racial struggle is a Jewish idea. And what follows from that, this is the end of chapter two of Mein Kampf, what follows from that is that the Jews have to be removed from the planet to restore humanity to its proper nature and to restore the planet itself. So for Hitler, the stakes are very high. They're just as high as they can be. Now, how can something like this work as politics? You might think that's absurd, but is it really so different from where we are now? If I speak of the emotions associated with this ideology, are they really so distant from emotions that we Americans, others, are capable of feeling? Hitler's basic idea was called Lebensraum. Lebensraum means space for life, living space. 
On the one hand, living space was all about anxiety. You are members of a race. There is only so much land. It is natural that you feel anxiety, dread, concern, anger about the possible shortage of food for your children and grandchildren. Fear is the natural state of affairs. That's one version of Lebensraum. At the same time, says Hitler, it is also natural if you are envious, if you are covetous, if you are jealous, if you want ever more, if you're not concerned so much about biological life as about standard of living, life, style. In his second book, Hitler makes very clear that it's normal for Germans to want to have the same standard of living as Americans. And not just objectively, it's normal for Germans to want to feel that they have the highest standard of living in the world. Right? And so Lebensraum is an appeal simultaneously to fear and anxiety and to jealousy and envy, very powerful political emotions. But how, you should be thinking and asking, how could such an ideology, if, if, if coherent as it might be, emotionally appealing as it might be, how could it make its way into politics? And here is where we have to reconsider Germany of the 1930s. I'd like to ask you to think about Germany in the 1930s, not in terms of some kind of authoritarian state. There were plenty of authoritarian states in interwar Europe, and none of them did the things that Nazi Germany did. I'd like to ask you, ask you to think about it not as just an example of extreme nationalism. There are plenty of extreme nationalist regimes in Europe in the 20s and 30s, and none of them did the precise things that Nazi Germany did. What was special about Nazi Germany in the 1930s is that it was a racial state in a very precise institutional sense. The ideas that I'm describing to you are not simply words on a page or concepts in a mind or a thousand minds or a million minds. They also have an institution, and that institution is the SS. In Germany in the 1930s, state authorities did not deal with violence in the normal way that state authorities do. A normal modern state aspires to monopolize, viol monopolize violence. A normal modern state wants to be the only unit which can legitimately apply violence. Nazi Germany in the 1930s was something else. There was the state, of course. There was the very functional German state, the army, the police. But there was also the SS. And the SS had a right to use violence even though it was not the state. This is very important. It had a right to carry out certain kinds of verdicts. And where? In the concentration camps. The concentration camps are extremely important for the history of the Holocaust, but not for the reasons we think. Jews did not die in large numbers in the concentration camps in Germany in the 19. 30s. That is not the path by which the Holocaust took place. The concentration camps are important for an entirely different reason, because the concentration camps were the model inside Nazi Germany of what lawlessness looks like. That is, by the way, the legal definition of a concentration camp, where the law does not apply, where the state is absent. And in Nazi Germany in the 1930s, it was the SS which filled the concentration camps with racial content. The concentration camps are a model, they're a template, they're a microcosm of what German power is going to look like after it gets beyond Germany. One way to think about this is to ask about the fate of the German Jews themselves. I've already said the German Jews are a rather small part of the Holocaust, right? About 3% of the victims will be German Jews. Looked at in terms of different numbers. The percentage of Jews in the German population in 1939 is about one quarter of 1%. It's a very small percentage of the population. If you look at the total numbers of Jews in Germany in 1933, when Hitler comes to power, most of them are going to survive. But the ones who die, where are they going to die? They're going to die, and this is an important clue, they're going to die beyond Germany. They're going to die in places like Riga. And so in some sense, our question is, how is it that German Jews get to Riga? And the answer is not so simple. They were, they were taken by trains beginning in September of 1941. How do we get from 1939, when the war starts, to 1941, when the Holocaust starts? How do we get from the moment when Erdene Lifshitz decides to flee Warsaw to the moment when Jews are being killed in the tens and hundreds of thousands and then in the millions? Now, to answer that question, I think we have to have a sense. No, I'm convinced we have to have a sense of Jewish life. 
in order to understand how the Holocaust could have proceeded from 1939 to 1941, we have to have some notion of how Jews lived in Europe in 1939, and not only in Germany. The vast majority of books about the Holocaust, the vast majority of convincing, powerful narratives about the Holocaust do pay attention to German Jews. But remember, they're not typical. Most of them are going to survive. There aren't very many of them. And when they die, they're going to die beyond Germany. So I think, no, I don't think, I'm sure we'd have to have a sense of how Jews could live in places like Austria or Czechoslovakia or the Baltic states or Poland or the Soviet Union, which is not to say that those six or seven regimes were the same. Czechoslovakia was a democracy. Austria was a right-wing authoritarian regime. The Soviet Union was a communist party state, right? The Baltic states were right-wing authoritarian regimes. But in all of these places where the Holocaust progresses towards mass murder, Jews were alive in considerable numbers through the 1930s. I think we have to start there. Why? Because it is as the history of the persecution of Jews goes beyond Germany, and as German power begins to realize itself in the destruction of neighboring states, that we see the repression of Jews truly escalate. In Germany by 1939, the repression of Jews had hit a bottleneck. The repression of Jews had stopped with Kristallnacht. There was unclear just how Jews could be repressed any more in Germany than they were already being. Kristallnacht was as bad as it got, and that was the murder of 200 people. Um, a horrifying tragedy and an international scandal by the standards of the time, but by our much sadder standards, not a Holocaust. So I think what we have to do is, when we consider the history of the Holocaust, look at German power extending beyond Germany and remember that there were societies and states there that German power transformed or destroyed. So think about Austria. Austria hardly ever figures in the history of the Holocaust until the day March 11th, 1938, when Austria is destroyed. Until the day, and I know you'll know it from the pictures, the day when the Jews of Vienna were taken out of their homes, were stopped on the street, were forced to scrub the streets of Vienna. This is a very important moment. In the next six weeks, Jews in Austria are going to suffer about as much as Jews in Germany had suffered in the previous six years, which is an extraordinary thing. Extra the, the discrimination of Jews in Austria is going to move much faster than discrimination of Jews in Germany. Why is that? It's because the Austrian state ceases to exist from one day to the next. The whole history of Nuremberg laws, Aryanization, the familiar progression of Nazi Germany does not happen in Austria. What does happen in Austria is that from one day to the next, from the 10th to the 11th of March 1938, that Friday evening, that Shabbat evening when Jews were breaking the rules and listening to the radio to find out what was going to happen, at 1757 that evening, the Austrian chancellor announced, in effect, that the Austrian state ceased to exist. And the very next morning, Jews were being humiliated on the streets of Vienna. And not just humiliated, this is important. The Jews who were scrubbing the streets of Vienna were not just cleaning the streets of Vienna. They were scrubbing a particular word off the streets, and that word was Österreich, Austria. On the 15th of June, 1938, there was, there was to have been a referendum on Austrian independence, which, by the way, would have passed almost certainly. They would have faked it if necessary. The propaganda for that referendum was one word, Österreich, Austria. When the Jews are scrubbing that word from the streets, what is happening is the politics of statelessness, the politics of a new regime. For a moment, no one is a citizen. Everyone knows that the old regime is gone. Everyone knows that Nazi power is coming. And the way that the non-Jews react to this is by blaming the previous regime on the Jews. And its fate will be their fate. Consider Czechoslovakia. If we think of Austria and Czechoslovakia, we think of them only in national terms. We think of Anschluss, the end of Austria. We think of Munich, the betrayal of Czechoslovakia. But what about the perspective of the citizens? What about the perspective of the Jewish citizens? From the point of view of the Jewish citizens, the end of Czechoslovakia means the end of citizenship. And the end of citizenship means something very, very significant. Let me give you an example which will seem obscure at the beginning, but which I hope will seem very enlightening within just a few moments. The example of Subcarpathian Ruthenia. 
Um, there's always someone in every crowd who is from Subcarpathian. Ruthenia, I would like to acknowledge you in advance <laughs> for your support. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what happens in Subcarpathian Ruthenia is extremely important to, for, for the whole development of the Holocaust, not just its logic, but in its actual beginning. In Subcarpathian Ruthenia, the far eastern part of Czechoslovakia, the, much of the territory is given to Hungary. What does Hungary do with the Jews on this territory? It does not acknowledge them as its citizens at all. It treats them as quote unquote stateless people, as quote unquote refugees, even though they've never gone anywhere. And when the moment arrives, when this is possible, Hungary deports them. In which direction? East. Where? Into Soviet Ukraine. When? At the moment that Germany is invading the Soviet Union in summer of 1941. What happens to those people? is that they are the victims of the first mass shooting, in the sense of shooting more than 10,000 people at once, the first mass shooting, I believe, in the history of the world, and certainly the first mass shooting in the history of the Holocaust. The beginning of the Holocaust is in mass shooting, and these are the first victims, these people whose history goes back to the destruction of Czechoslovakia. Or consider, of course, Poland. What could be more important than the case of Poland? What is special about Poland, of course, is that Poland is the place in September of 1939 where Germany destroys a state by force. Austria does not resist. Czechoslovakia does not resist. In each case, the persecution of Jews can be escalated significantly, and I stress this, compared to Nazi Germany itself. But the, the destruction of Poland is a, yet another step, major step forward. Because in the destruction of Poland in September 1939, the Germans are able to mobilize conventional state power, the Wehrmacht, to defeat the Polish army, but simultaneously bring to bear for the first time massively and violently the SS. The Einsatzgruppen, the SS Einsatzgruppen, are used for the first time as mass murder units in September of 1939 in Poland. Their assignment is to murder the Polish political class, to make it impossible for there to be a Polish state. They are quite literally state destroyers. That is their mission. Now, the idea that the Polish state should not exist is no metaphorical overstretch on my part. This is exactly the German line. The German line when Germany invaded Poland was that we are not invading a state. There is no Polish state. We are arriving in territory which is occupied by nebulous, undefinable human beings. What we are carrying out is not an occupation, because in order for it to be an occupation, there must be a state that you are occupying. This is quite literally the German legal position about what they are doing in September of 1939. And this, of course, has palpable implications for everyone, because no one is a citizen now. Everyone is a kind of colonial subject. And it has the greatest implications for Jews. Think about ghettoization the most manifest oppression of Jews in Poland. This is now 1940, early 1941. What ghettoization is, among other things, is the loss of the right to do what you want with your body and the loss of your property rights. Jews lose all of their property rights um, just when the Polish government loses all of its property in September of 1939. The forced movement of Jews from the villages, from the edges of the cities, from the other districts of the cities into ghettos in late 1940, 1941, is, among other things, a, a consequence of the end of the Polish state. Again, in very precise ways, the Jews no longer have rights, and the people who are going to run the ghettos, right, the Judenrat. The Judenrat is another good example of, an, of something which only turns up right when it's necessary for the narrative, right at the moment when it seems important. But who, who is the Judenrat? Who are these people? They are the same men and they were all men, the same men who were the Jewish elders in interwar Jewish communal autonomy, right? The very same people. When the institutions changed, their roles changed. And the Polish policemen, the so-called blue policemen, who surrounded the ghetto, and in that sense made them possible as well. Who were these people? For the most part, they were Polish interwar policemen, very often the same people who had guarded Jewish markets in the 1930s and had worked against pogroms. Without the Polish state, 
without the previous hierarchy, now that they are subordinate to Himmler's apparatus, what they do is very different. So the destruction of the Polish state in these ways and many others creates an entirely different world for Jews very quickly. And it's a horrifying world. It's a world of disease and death. It's a world where in the ghetto, the ratio of births to deaths is something like one to 45. It's a world in which in the ghettos, tens of thousands of people will die of malnutrition and disease during the winters, especially people who came from the countryside, who were generally robbed as they made their way from the countryside into the city and arrived at the city with no possessions and no acquaintances. Those are the people who died first. That's awful enough. But it is not yet a Holocaust. Poland is invaded in 1939. The mass murder of Polish Jews begins in earnest in early 1942, around two and a half years later. So we have to ask ourselves still, when and how precisely did the Holocaust begin? What were its fundamental causes? Here, Irena Lipschitz's story will help us again. Remember her predicament, because her predicament is absolutely typical of this region, and it reveals the politics that we have to understand. She left Warsaw and went east. There was a German invasion from the west, then there was a Soviet invasion from the east. What does this mean for politics? Why am I stressing this as politics? It means that something very special is happening when Germany invades the Soviet Union. It is not only that when Germany invades the Soviet Union in June of 1941, it is killing Jews in large numbers for the first time. It's killing them in large numbers for the first time because why? Because they are defined as part of the political class. The Einsatzgruppen, when they enter the Soviet Union in June of 1941, have the same kinds of orders as they had in September of 1939 when they entered Poland, murder the political class. The difference is that in the Soviet Union, Jews were defined as part of the political class. I find it interesting, um, and this is a joke that works well in Poland but might not here, that even Hitler was not sufficiently anti-Semitic to think that Jews were the ruling class of Poland. Um, I just, I'd like to have that on the record. I'll just leave it there. Um, so, that, but it's not only this. You all know that the Einsatzgruppen are murdering Jews from the beginning of the, of the German invasion. But beyond that, you have a very special kind of politics, which comes from the fact that the Soviet Union had just invaded right before the German invasion. If you think of Yedvabne, right, the pogrom in 1941 of which you all surely will have heard, how did that pogrom unfold? It unfolded according to a German model in Bialystok, where the Germans killed thousands of Jews themselves after having forced them into a synagogue and about 20 smaller synagogues, um, forcing them to sing or play Soviet songs, forcing them to carry red banners, and then burning the synagogues and shooting the people who came out. In Yedvabne and in a couple of dozen other places, Poles performed the same choreography, scenography, with the Jews. Why is that significant? It doesn't at all reduce the murderousness of this to point to the fact that this is politics. It's the same politics as Vienna in 1938. Polish peasants in the summer of 1941 react to regime change, react to the politics of statelessness, pretty much the same way as the Viennese middle class in 1938. The, the, we are not the people who supported the previous regime. The Jews are the people who supported the previous regime. Now, in 1941, this is much more dangerous and much more murderous in 1938 because the Germans are already killing Jews. And what the Germans are consciously trying to do is to find a way to bring locals in to killing Jews. The pogroms don't work as well as they expect. But what the, what the Germans find as they work their way into the Baltic states is the pogroms can be, serve as a kind of selection, a kind of training ground where they can extract people who will take part in much larger and much more organized murderous actions. Why in the Baltic states? Again, I have to implore you to think about the politics. It is not that in the Baltic states there was more anti-Semitism than there was in, say, Poland. That would be absurd. It's not that in the Baltic states there was more anti-Semitism than there was in, say, France. Also not true. What is special about the Baltic states is that these were the only independent states to be destroyed in their entirety by the Soviet Union. This means that when the Germans enter in 1941, they can not only bring with them 
local people as propagandists. They can motivate, they can mobilize emotions, which we don't understand perhaps, which are very real. We hopefully will never have to understand them, right? Whatever our nation might be, but the emotions that are generated by the total destruction of a national state, feelings of shame, feelings of humiliation, and perhaps most importantly, the desire to undo one's own, collabor un own collaboration with the prior occupier. The single most important collaborator in, in the single most important collaborator in the Baltic states, and indeed the single most important collaborator in the Holocaust as a whole, was a man called Viktor Arais in Latvia. What was Viktor Arais doing under the Soviet occupation? He was a Communist Party member. He was a believing communist. He even earned a law degree. He wrote his dissertation on the Soviet Constitution of 1936. What was Arais doing before the Soviets arrived? He was a policeman for the independent Latvian state. There is very little to connect him with any kind of ideological conviction. There is a huge amount to connect him to the negative opportunism of double collaboration. All throughout this zone, where Soviet power had come and then German power replaced it, you see massive double collaboration. And where do you see it now? In the Jewish sources. In the Jewish sources in Russian, in the Jewish sources in Polish, in the Jewish sources in Yiddish, because the Jews are the ones, not the Germans, who would notice that their neighbor first collaborated with the Soviets and then with the Germans. The Jews are the ones who would complain, aha, my neighbor first collaborated with the Soviets and now blames me for having done so. This appears over and over again in the Jewish sources. So, this phenomenon of double collaboration is one of the reasons why the Holocaust progresses in the East. The other reason is what you might call self-recruitment. If you consider the, the doom of those Jews from Czechoslovakia, from Eastern Czechoslovakia, from Subcarpathian Ruthenia, they were killed along with local Jews, 23,600 people in August of 1941 in a place called Kamienic Podilski. They were killed by members of the SS, German policemen, the German Wehrmacht and local collaborators. In other words, in the East, Germans cooperated in the Holocaust in ways that their own leaders did not anticipate. The SS was able, in the zone of statelessness, which was the invaded Soviet Union, to recruit the army and the police to the task of mass murder, and that very quickly. And so, by the time we reach Kamenets Podilski, or by the time we reach Riga in November and December of 1941, we have a method which involves multiple German institutions with the help of large numbers of local people who are organized into commandos or militias, carrying out industrial scale mass murder of the Jews. And it's, it's this period, it's this moment which is decisive for the Holocaust, for the Holocaust quite literally, because it's, it's in late 1941 that the final solution, the general idea of removing the Jews from the planet, President Hitler's ideology from the beginning, becomes the reality of what we call the Holocaust, the mass murder of Jews, the murder so massive that it can convey the idea that all the Jews under German power can be murdered. And, and indeed, that is what German policy becomes as of early 1942. What do we see then? We see some striking things. In Poland, the Holocaust now proceeds. Again, two and a half years after the German invasion, two and a half years after the German invasion, but immediately after the lesson has been learned in the East, in the occupied Soviet Union, that mass murder is possible. It, it proceeds according to different techniques. The Jews, having already been gathered in large ghettos, can be sent to killing facilities like Belzec, Sobibor, Treblinka, Chelmno. And most of the Polish Jews, the huge majority, around 95%, will be killed. Note the percentage of Polish Jews under German occupation and the percentage of Soviet Jews under German occupation who die is essentially exactly the same. Now, I say that the German policy is general, and it was. It's applied not just to Poland, but to the entirety of European territory that the Germans control. What is striking, though, is that this policy, although it's general in principle, right? In principle, the idea is the absolute physical extermination of all the Jews under German control. In practice, it's very irregular in its application. From place to place, from zone to zone, um, how the extent to which it can be implemented is very different. To give you just a very rough idea, 
in the places where the state has been destroyed or where the German aspiration was to destroy the state, the chance of a Jew surviving was one in 20. In the places where a state persisted, even if it was a flawed state, an authoritarian state, an anti-Semitic state, a state allied with Nazi Germany, Nazi Germany itself, the chances of a Jew surviving were about one in two. Now, one in two is awful. It's worse than any other victim group in occupied Europe, but it is very different from one in 20. This is the situation which I describe in the book as the Auschwitz paradox. Auschwitz represents, on the one hand, the aspiration to exterminate all of the Jews, but on the other hand, the irregularity and the unevenness of the implementation. Why was this? Well, there are several ways to think about this. One is the numbers, as I've already said. The other is to consider the chronology. The way that Germany invaded Poland and the Soviet Union in 1939 and 1941 was special. The aspiration to totally destroy the political system was special. The use of the Einsatzgruppen to try to physically exterminate the political class was special. These things were not done in Belgium or France or Denmark or the Netherlands, right? And since they had not been done in 1940, they could not, so to speak, be done again. The countries could not be reinvaded. That's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is in terms of institutions. You might not think that foreign ministers are very important, right? You're the, probably the last thing you're thinking about right now are diplomats. But it makes a, the basic institutions of sovereignty make a tremendous difference. A country with an anti-Semitic ruling class and government like Romania, a country which is carrying out a policy of the mass murder of Jews, Romania, can switch foreign policy orientations and for that reason changes policies towards Jews. You're probably thinking, what difference does it make? Um, what passport you have? It made all the difference in the world. The Holocaust only proceeded insofar as Jews were not recognized by states. If you were a Romanian Jew, just to stay with the Romanian example, in 1943, and the French government sent you to Drancy, which was the French transit camp to Auschwitz, the Germans would not kill you at Auschwitz because the Romanian government did not wish it so. Right? If you were a Jew and you had membership in a state, which the Germans recognized as a state, they would not kill you. So papers meant everything. And this, by the way, is something that Jews and pretty much everyone else in Eastern Europe knew. And this appears over and over again in the sources. Um, so these, what about bureaucracy? Bureaucracy has a very bad name. We think about, and we have our own self-interested reasons for not liking bureaucracy. Who likes bureaucracy? Well, the, the thing which is worse than bureaucracy is no bureaucracy. It was actually very difficult to go through the tiresome process, which was tiresome even in Nazi Germany, where they never actually finally managed to define who a Jew was. It was much harder to go through the process of bureaucratically excluding, discriminating against, um, oppressing Jews than it was to destroy the state, to create a bureaucracy-free zone. For German, remember, for German Jews to be killed, they had to be extracted from the German bureaucracy and sent some place, place like Riga, right? Or Minsk, where the Austrian Jews were sent, where bureaucracy no longer functioned. Not because these were wild places where there never was bureaucracy, but because the Germans destroyed the local state apparatus. The bureaucracy free zones were where people were killed. Another way to make this point, or to consider this point, is by making comparisons, right? The comparisons reveal that some of our intuitions about what might be responsible for higher death rates may not function. I've already mentioned that Poland and the Soviet Union have exactly the same death rates for Jews. Exactly the same death rates for Jews. So if you think that Polish anti-Semitism is the explanation, then one has a lot of work to do on the Soviet side to make that explanation work. What Poland and the Soviet Union have in common is that these were the major states that Germany tried to destroy. Or consider in Western Europe, maybe more familiar cases, the Netherlands and France. In the Netherlands, probably the least anti-Semitic place in Western Europe, the one place where people actually protested on the streets, anti-Semitic policies when German occupation came, 75% of the Jews die. In France, which everyone then and now considers to have had a much more significant anti-Semitism problem than the Netherlands, 75% of the Jews are going to survive. Why? Because the occupation regime was different. In the Netherlands, the SS ran the occupation regime. The government left. 
In France, you had, and again, one doesn't have to like these governments, but one had a sovereign state with a fairly conventional military occupation regime, and that's what makes the difference. Or if you want an extreme example, consider Denmark and Estonia, two states on the Baltic Sea, relatively small populations of Jews, relatively weak traditions of anti-Semitism. In Denmark, 99% of the Danish citizens who are Jewish are going to survive. In Estonia, 99% of the Jews who are present when the Germans arrive are going to be killed. 99%, 99%. That cannot be explained by any pre-war phenomenon. What you have instead are the extremes of occupation. Denmark was the most conventional, traditional, and gentle occupation regime. There was parliamentary government, there were elections, there were normal changes of government, the monarch stayed, and so on. In Estonia, you have the extreme opposite. You have double occupation, Soviet destruction of the Estonian state, um, and, and all the associated consequences. A final way to make this point, I don't mean to belabor it, but it's very important, is to consider regions. You probably know the nice story of Bulgaria, right? The nice story of Denmark, I'm happy to deconstruct for you in questions and answers. The nice story of Bulgaria is that the king didn't want to kill the Jews. Bulgaria didn't send its Jews. Partially true, but everywhere in Bulgaria where territory changed hands, where there was that particular, specific, devastating moment where sovereignty was for a moment in flux, everywhere where that was true, the Jews died. So everywhere where Bulgaria gained territory, in Thrace and Macedonia, they sent their Jews to Auschwitz to die. And this is the general pattern. Even if you consider Romania, which is usually not considered in the same breath as, Romania, as, as Bulgaria, but in this sense it's the same, almost all of the Romanian Jews that were killed by Romania were killed in territories which were lost and then regained, almost all of them, well over 95%. And this is true everywhere in the region. A final example is Paris. Consider Paris. Who was at the most danger in Paris? What was the largest victim group of the French Holocaust? Polish Jews. And I don't just mean proportionately. I mean in absolute numbers. More Polish Jews were killed than French Jews in the French Holocaust. Why was that? It didn't have anything to do with Polish anti-Semitism, real though that is as a phenomenon. It had to do with the fact that those Jews were not recognized by any state. Okay, so where does this lead us? This is my final and closing word. It leads us to, I think, a moment, an opportunity to reconsider what we mean by rescue. What rescue did mean historically and what it mm, perhaps ought to mean for us now. Who could rescue? You probably have guessed, diplomats. Diplomats could rescue. Diplomats could rescue because you couldn't take their citizenship away, right? In the Netherlands, the people who tried to rescue Anne Frank were not prosecuted because what they did was not a crime. They were citizens. If you were a citizen, it was much easier to rescue a Jew than if you lived in a colonial stateless zone where, then, where no one was a citizen. The citizens of France were citizens. The inhabitants of Poland were nothing. The inhabitants of the Union were nothing. And a diplomat was someone from whom you could not extract citizenship. And a diplomat was someone who could, as it were, magically extend state recognition to other people. So whether it was the Chinese consul in Vienna or the Japanese consul in Lithuania or Raoul Wallenberg in Budapest. It was the diplomats who could rescue more than 100 people. Almost all of the rescuers of more than 100 people were diplomats. When you move down the scale of rescuers, what you see is the confirmation of the general argument that the more that people depend on the state, can depend on the state, the easier or the less difficult it is for them to rescue. As you move into institutions like uh, partisan armies or churches, institutions that are a bit like a state, you find sometimes they kill and sometimes they rescue. As you move closer and closer to anarchy, where there are no institutions, where there's no law, almost no one rescues. Very few people rescue. A few people do. The people in the book I call the righteous few. A few people show that Hitler is wrong about what happens in conditions of manufactured anarchy, but they are precious few. Which brings me to the end of Irena Lipschitz's story. So Irena stops the first person she sees, 
I'm walking down this path through the middle of the swamp. There's a man, double-barreled shotgun over his shoulder. She stops him and asks him for help. Without batting an eye, he agrees immediately to help her. He takes her in. They build a bunker. They build a shelter. She stays on his property for a very long time. She's going to survive the war. Over the course of her acquaintance, she learns some interesting things about this man. One interesting thing, really, and that is that he defied all authority. In interwar Poland, Wysotsk, this little town, this region, Polesia, these swamps had been in Poland. He had defied the Polish government by sheltering communists. When the Soviet Union came in 1939, he had defied the Soviets and their deportation policies by sheltering Poles. When the Germans came in 1941, he defied the killing policy that we call the Holocaust by sheltering Jews. He defied all authority. Not all rescuers had this kind of adventurous attitude towards authority, but what they did share, something very rare, was some kind of internal commitment to a certain sort of moral order which did not change when the circumstances around them changed. And this, I'm afraid, was very rare. In the Jewish sources, Jews have even more difficulty than the rescuers themselves defining the motivations of the rescuers. They use words like humanity, menschlichkeit, right? This word appears a lot. And essentially what it means is that these were people who did not change when the circumstances around them changed. But they were very few. Elena Lifshitz, in her testimony, which she gave in late 1945 in, in Warsaw, um, there's a, she, she excludes something very interesting from her testimony. She doesn't leave something behind. She leaves out one thing, which I find very interesting. I'm going to share this omission with you, and then I'll be done. She doesn't give us the man's name. There's an obvious reason for this, and that is that whatever the next authority was going to be, which was going to be Soviet authority. He was going to continue to try to smuggle and make moonshine, which was how he made his life. He was going to continue to defy whatever that authority was. That's the obvious reason. But there's something else I want you to consider. He doesn't, she doesn't leave us a name. Um, and in not leaving us a name, she doesn't leave us with the idea that there was one single person who redeemed whatever it might be, whatever nation he belonged to. We don't know that either, whether he believed he belonged to a nation at all. We don't know, but there is no person who can redeem a Polish nation or a Belarusian nation or a Ukrainian nation or any nation. There is no person who by his or her good action can redeem the killing in the Holocaust, the crime of the Holocaust from a Christian point of view, the sin of the Holocaust. There is no person, there is no action which can redeem that. There is no way the story can be brought to any kind of satisfactory ending. There is no way, in other words, to treat the Holocaust adequately, persuasively, plausibly as history, which involves pushing the responsibility off onto other groups, which involves drawing lines. What we see in the Holocaust is that people behaved very similarly in similar circumstances, which means that, which means that when we think of rescue, we have to think not just of individuals, exceptional individuals, we have, to not, we have to remember that we and the people we know would very likely not behave that way in similar circumstances. And I think we have to recall, or not recall, consider that the way to think about rescue like, is political, that the way to think about the future, the way to think about preventing cat catastrophes of this kind cannot reside only in emulation of models. It has to also reside in commitment to the kinds of structures which make this kind of action less likely. That's a less glamorous ending than a happy ending or a redeeming ending. But there are no happy endings to this. There are no redeeming end endings to this. But there might be historical lessons. Thank you very much. We have some time for some questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and wait till we acknowledge you. And if it's possible for you to come to the aisle to ask your question, we'd be grateful. But if not, it's okay too. 
I read your book, Bloodland. It is a marvelous book. I recommend it to everybody about what's going on these in front. You mentioned that uh, political scientists and historians and other types of authorities have looked at this issue. You did not mention psychologists. Mm -hmm. And I submit that you cannot understand the Holocaust without addressing psychology and the psychobiology of what is happening and what happened. And if you look at the psychopath or the sociopath, these are people who are bullies, who they're charismatic, who they're pathological liars, and the list goes on and on. They can arouse people, etc. cetera. And uh, there's a book that I think I would recommend, which is by Simon Baron Cohen, who was Sasha Baron Cohen's cousin of Kazakhstan. And it shows the biology of psychopaths. And what he demonstrates and has been demonstrated is that in the psychopaths, when you do a functional MRI, which measures blood flow to certain areas of the brain, there are certain areas such as the right frontal temporal uh, area, or the cingulate gyrus, and there are several others. I won't go into that. But these don't light up. Mm -hmm. And so I submit that all these analysis of uh, um, of uh, the Holocaust has to look at the psychology, the psychobiology, and some might even say we have somebody ready for the president who may have some of these attributes. You, you think there's only one, do you? <laughs> no, you're, you're, you're an optimist, my friend. Um, so I, 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 I would agree with you in general um, I, I would, I would, I, but, but, and, and what I would say is that, as it, so historians are interested in simple things. We're interested in continuity and change. And if one looks at the Holocaust, one is considering a, 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 a massive and radical change, where in the space, if you look at the Pol if you're considering the Polish Jews, you're looking at an event in which, in the, over the course of basically a year, the huge majority of the of the of, of Polish Jews are killed. To explain that, to explain change, one can't appeal only to psychological states or psychological characteristics, which are more or less constant. One can make arguments of the type that, in certain kinds of conditions, people with certain kinds of predispositions come to the fore. I'd be comfortable with that. What I do in the book is a slightly different style of argument which maybe you wouldn't accept as psychological, but it's close. It's something like the, the micropolitics of responsibility, right? So the moment that something interesting is happening when polls, I mean, something horrifying is happening too, but something, something psychologically interesting is happening when polls not only kill Jews in a barn by burning the barn, but they make sure the Lenin statue is in their inside. Something psychologically interesting is happening when Austrians Christians not only humiliate Jews, but make them scrub the word Austria from the streets. The symbolism is important because the symbolism involves a transfer of responsibility, which is a psychological or a psychic act, and then the elimination of responsibility as well. What I'm very much interested in is, or the way that I, would, I understand all of this, is that politics never stops. We never reach a moment where a kind of political history doesn't matter. We get right down to the level of the individual and his or her psyche, and the political situation still matters a lot. And as far as charisma is concerned, right, moving back up to that, I would say that it's in, it's in, in, in and this is how I share your general worry about the world, maybe. Charisma, people of charismatic dispositions, uh, tend to make great entrances at times of globalization crisis, right? I mean, not to make a huge, big argument, but we are in crisis of globalization mark two, and crisis of globalization mark one was the 1920s and 1930s. Question up here to your right. Uh, do you see any uh, parallelism with what's going on in the Middle East, the Holocaust that is going on in the Middle East with Iraq and the statelessness of certain areas of Iraq and Syria with what went on in World War II. Okay. So, yes, I, I, I do. But let, me try to be, let me try to be precise about it. I won't be as precise about it as, as, I, as, I, as I was in the book, right? So I, I actually, in the conclusion of the book, I spend some time on this issue. With, with respect to Iraq, let me start with the Iraq War. That is the American invasion of Iraq. 
in, in 2003. One of the arguments that we Americans made for the invasion of Iraq was that Hitler was an authoritarian tyrant and Saddam Hussein is an authoritarian tyrant. That, I think, right at the beginning, that we go wrong. It's not that Hitler was not a tyrant. It's not, it's not, it, the, point is, the point about Hitler is that he believed not in some kind of national or statist ideology. He, be, he truly believed, he truly believed in some kind of planetary ecological anarchy. He was not some kind of canny, clannish leader who managed to get to the top of the state and stayed at the top of the state by way of murderous secret police, right? Like Saddam Hussein. He was a crusading anarchist who truly believed that in destroying the states around him, he was restoring the planet to its proper essence. And the Holocaust did not happen because pre-war Germany oppressed its own citizens. There, that, that, that comes into the story, but it's not, it's not the whole story, and I'm convinced it's not even most of the story. So in, in that analogy, I think we not only go wrong, went wrong, but in a way we had it backwards. Because if we had thought, well, the Holocaust happened because a state destroyed other states. Again, that's a simplification, right? But if we thought the Holocaust happened because a state destroyed other states, then you hesitate to destroy other states. I mean, to be very clear, I'm not saying that, you know, Bush was Hitler or any such absurdity or the United States was Nazi Germany. I'm just saying that if that had been one standard way of thinking about the Holocaust, then we wouldn't have made the Holocaust argument to destroy the Iraqi regime. Um, and we did, right? And a lot of people did. And it was, I th and I was, and I, at the time, I thought this was, was completely backwards, right? And I think that the consequences of destroying the Iraqi regime have more or less borne this out, right? Again, it was a terrible, murderous regime. I have no sympathy for it. But that doesn't, but, but destroying it not only killed more people than its existence killed, it opened up zones of statelessness where terrorism could prosper. It drove more than a million Iraqi citizens into the suburbs of Syrian cities in 2003, 2004, 2005, where they were joined by more than a million internally displaced people from Syria during the famine of 7, 8, 9. And that is the background, or some of the background anyway, for the civil war which is going on now in Syria. And in Syria, of course, today, we have, I mean, maybe more than one genocide, but at least a textbook genocide of the Yazidi, right, um, where the United States, the Committee on Conscience, which I completely agree with, has defined um, the, the, the separation of, of, of Yazidi women away from the men, their sex slavery and the murder of the men as, as genocide, right? And, and many other horrible things are happening in Syria as well. So when you ask do I see a connection, here's how I see it. The Holocaust is unprecedented and different from all other, other events, but if one treats it as a history with causes, and some of those causes are things like statelessness, one has an intellectual toolkit that one can use to make other things make a little bit more sense than they might otherwise. I think that order in our world is impossible. I mean, it's going to sound like, you know, this is going to sound like, um, you know, Unitarianism, but I think, I, I Oh, I see there's a lot of sympathy for Unitarianism in this crowd. Um, or Quakerism, right? Some of my best Jews are friends. Um, the, the, um, uh, I don't think in this world you get order without justice. I, I, think, that's a, I think that's a false choice. Um, and and that, that beyond the Middle East, I mean, in the, so no, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't accept that in those terms of engagement. Thank you. It's, I mean, it's a great question because that's not, I mean, more, more relevantly, that's Putin's argument. And I think Russian intervention on the side of quote unquote order reveals the problems with the argument. <clears throat> I lost my family in the Holocaust, like many people I'm sure in the room, 123 people <clears throat> at best count. I also have encountered immense anti-Semitism in this country growing up where I was forced to fight in the streets every single day. All my instincts show me that America is very similar now to what Germany was going through. I'm curious about your response, whether you think there is an analogy that's a fair analogy. And the second thing, when I studied the Shoah and the Holocaust, I saw occult roots. There were occult roots of the Nazism have been recorded 
documented, and many books have come out, beyond being an ecological anarchist, these were people that work with very dark forces. Do you feel that that's valid, and can you share any insight towards that? Thank you. So, I mean, with, with, the, uh, with the analogy to present day politics, I think one wants to be very precise. W one of the problems with political discourse in this country is that we have, we say, that's Hitler, no it's not, and then there's nothing really else to be said, you know? It's become, even before the current election cycle, about which I too am very troubled, um, we had reached the point where people said, he's like Hitler, and then the response is, he hasn't killed six million Jews, and then that's the end of the discussion. So we, we, we've lost our ability to